Welcome to Simple Truth Gospel with Kirian. Today, we will study Ephesians chapter 5. We are almost done with the book of Ephesians. If you missed any of our previous studies, you can go to our website. It is kuim.org. Or you can go to our YouTube channel or SoundCloud channel. Uh, it is Simple Truth Gospel with Kirian. All of our teachings are posted online. Before we continue, let's have a word of prayer together. Heavenly Father, we all agree as touching this. I'm thanking you for another opportunity for us to gather today to study your word. I pray that by your Holy Spirit, you will open the eyes of our understanding. You will teach us your word. You will give us revelation, knowledge, and understanding of the scriptures. Dear Holy Spirit, you are the greatest teacher. Minister to every one of us, wherever we are, simultaneously. Give us what you want us to get out of today's teaching. You know what everyone needs. Help us to be doers. Of the word of God as we get the revelation today and not just hear us only deceiving ourselves. We propose in our hearts to be doers. We ask you to empower us to do this. Heavenly Father, I thank you because by the power of the Holy Ghost you will help us to walk circumspectfully, not as fools. But as wise, redeeming the time for the day, the days are evil. Teach us to number our days, that we may obtain the heart of wisdom. Not unto us, O Lord, not unto us, but unto your name we give glory, praise, worship, and thanksgiving. For everything that you have done in the name of Jesus Christ. And everybody say amen. Welcome everybody. Today we are going to study Ephesians chapter 5. So far we have covered uh, chapters 1, 2, 3 and 4. And today we will cover chapter 5. If you miss anything, always go to our website and... Uh, youtube channel all the teachings are there and you can watch them at your own convenience let me give you a summary of what we have covered so far the book of ephesians was written by paul himself while he was in prison in rome in chapters one two and three paul writes about what we have in Christ Jesus. Not only what we have in Christ Jesus, but who we are in Christ Jesus. And he, he gave us some examples, like we, we are chosen in Christ Jesus. Before the foundation of the earth, we were accepted in the beloved. We have the inheritance of God in Christ Jesus. The same power that raised Jesus Christ from the dead now dwells in every one of us. And also we have boldness and access with confidence by faith in Christ Jesus. So these are the things that we covered in chapters 1, 2, and 3. And in chapter 4, which we covered last week, Paul writes about responding to, the, to that which we are aware of. He says, now that we are aware of the things that we have in Christ Jesus, we're supposed to respond by living a Christian life, a life that will be conformed to the image of Christ. So he tells us, he gives us some of the examples, humility, patience, gentleness, walking in love, and uh, forgiving each other, even as God in Christ 
forgave us. These are the things that we covered in chapter 4 last week. So today, he's going to continue to tell us how to live a Christian life. Remember that um, uh, uh, we're going to be covering, like I said, chapters 4 and 5. We'll be talking about the way to walk out your Christian faith. The way to live it out. Now that you have been saved... That spirit of God that dwells in you, the spirit of God that dwells in you, supposed to help you now bear fruit, fruit of righteousness. So we're going to go ahead now and uh, get into chapter 5. And I'll read it to you. Verse 1, Therefore be imitators of God as their children. And walk in love, as Christ also has loved us and given himself for us, an offering and a sacrifice to God for a sweet-smelling aroma. Remember last week we ended up with um, loving one, forgiving one another, even as God in Christ Jesus forgave us. Today, he begins with walking in love. To the extent that God loves us. So the question is this. How does God love us? How much does God love us? How much does Jesus Christ love us? The love of God for us is unconditional. It is everlasting in Jeremiah chapter 31, the Bible, he, Bible says, God talking to Israel, he says, I have loved you with everlasting love. In John chapter 3 verse 16, the Bible tells us, For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believes should not perish but have everlasting life. This is how much God loves us. How much does Jesus love us? Now, the love, the love of Jesus Christ to us is unconditional and it is sacrificial. For no greater love than, the, than this, that a man should lay down his life for his friends. This is how much Jesus Christ loves us. For he has made him to be sin for us who knew no sin, that will be made the righteousness of God. 2 Corinthians 5.21 So, now, Jesus Christ being our example, he commands us to love one another. He says, for new commandments I have given to you that you love one another, even as I have loved you. He says, for by this will men know that you are my disciples if you have loved one for another. For we know that we have passed from life to death because we we have passed from death to life because we love the brethren. So this is a commandment from Jesus Christ. But now he's talking about the brethren, which means the one in our family, in our gatherings, in our church. But he stepped it up one step. He stepped it up. And he says, love your enemies and pray for those who spitefully use you and persecute you. For even the, 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 the wicked, the, 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 the hidden, they love one another. So what is the difference? So he wants us now to, not only that we should love our brethren, but we should also love those, the people who hate us. And someone will say, how is it possible? This is a big demand. How can I love these ones who don't love me, who don't care about me? And the Bible tells us it's possible, not only, not by your own ability. But it tells us in Romans chapter 5 verse 5, it says, For the love of Christ is shed abroad in our heart by the Holy Ghost. So it says now the Holy Spirit, the day you got born again, he moved into your heart and he came in with the love of Christ. 
For the fruit of the Spirit is love. So it says, it's now possible that you can love those who are not lovable. How? By you depending on in the power of the Holy Ghost to be able to do it. You can't do it on your own natural ability. It's impossible. This is where so many Christians miss it because they are trying to do it on their own. But it's not possible. So he tells us, Jesus Christ gave us the commandment. But he gave us empowerment to be able to fulfill his commandment. Blessed be the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Glory, hallelujah, amen. Oh, thank you, Lord Jesus Christ. So we move forward now in verse 3. It says, But fornication and all uncleanness or covetedness, let it not even be named among you, as is fitting for saints, neither filthiness, no foolish talking, no coarse jesting, which are not fitting, but rather giving of thanks. Now, he just finished talking about love. So, he tells us some actions, behaviors that are inconsistent with love. The first one he talks about here is fornication. Now, the word fornication, the Greek word is ponia, from where we get uh, pornography. It means any illegal, any illicit sexual activity. Now, what does it mean? Any sexual activity that is apart from how God ordained it, which is between husband and wife. Anything outside this is illicit. And the Bible condemns it. It is an act of selfishness. For the simple reason that when you lure people into committing these illicit sexual activities with you, you are doing it to satisfy your own lust. You don't have them in mind. And after you commit these things with them, you leave them with regrets, with the consequences. And they are miserable because they don't like it. Quite unfortunate that we have so many people in the church today who are tempting people to fall into this kind of uh, sin. And the Bible condemns it. Now he talks about... Uh, Covetousness. Now, what is covetousness? It is a vehement desire to get something. And if the desire is not quenched, you will go to any extent to obtain it. Some people might call it greed. But... Remember, it's a desire. Bible calls it idolatry. You want it. You desire it so much that you are willing to do anything just to possess it. This is just the desire part of it. You have not even committed the crime yet. <laughs> Let me give an example, friends. The Bible said, I shall not commit adultery. That's what the Pharisees, that's what they thought. And they were talking about this in actual behavior, which means when you act it out. But Jesus Christ came and he showed them the intent of the law. He says, if anyone looks at a woman lustfully in their heart, they have already committed adultery. So this covetousness is a thing of the heart. When you desire something and you are willing to go to any extent, what is the motive behind this selfishness? It's not an act of love. And then he talks about here, foolish talking and jesting. So what is jesting? It's bad jokes. Bad jokes. 
Remember sometimes when we come up, when we come up with these bad jokes, the intention sometimes is to make someone laugh. That's probably what we had in mind before we come up with these jokes. But we forget to think about the impact it's going to have on the hearer. Sometimes it puts a permanent stain in their minds. Something that they have to live with a long time. Because these jokes are dirty. They are filled up with uh, 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 things that are not of God. So it tells us not to have this kind of conversations. Let no corrupt communication proceed out of your mouth. But that which is good unto edifying, that it might minister grace to the hearer. So it tells you, instead of you having these conversations, let your conversation be such that will bring glory to God, such that will give thanks to God, such that will bring somebody to the praising of our Lord Jesus Christ. In verse 5, he says, For this you know, that no fornicator, unclean person, nor covetous man, who is an idolater, may have any inheritance in the kingdom of Christ and God. Friends, you see this section right here. To so many Christians, when they read this portion right here, they are greatly troubled. For the same reason that they know they don't measure up. They have fallen into this kind of sin before. So they are troubled. They ask themselves, does it mean that I'm not going to see the kingdom of God, but I'm born again? And then the enemy of your soul, the accuser of the brethren, Satan and his demons, they will help you out with more thoughts in your heart. They will say, yeah, you think. You're going to see the kingdom of God. You see right there? You may as well go all the way and sing because you're not going to see the kingdom of God. But is that what he's talking about here? So what is he talking about here? He says that we not see the kingdom of God. There is a big difference between someone who is not born again and someone who is born again. The one who is not born again, doing this thing is a practice for them. They drive great joy doing them. They want to perfect it. They brag in doing them. They tell people when they do them. They have no regrets or no any repentance. So they continue to do more and more and more just to perfect their sins. But to that one who is born again, you and I. Once in a while, we may be tempted to fall into this kind of sin. Paul says that I, I have not yet apprehended that for which I was apprehended by Christ. Either am I perfect. None of us, we are not perfect. No one is perfect. But the difference is this. If a believer, if a child of God is tempted to fall into this kind of a sin, what he does is he repents immediately. It pains him so much. He is not happy about it. He regrets it. He asks God for forgiveness. And then... In 1 John chapter 1, verse 9, the Bible says, if we, forgive our, if, we for, if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. So the child of God, when he falls into this kind of a sin, he repents and he asks for forgiveness. And the blood of Jesus cleanses him from all unrighteousness. So this is the difference. So if you have been hemmed in, with this kind of scripture. That's what he's talking about. 
So don't let the enemy condemn you. Don't let him put you in the place of regret. But otherwise, know that you have been washed. And the blood of Jesus cleans you from every unrighteousness. Blessed be the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. In verse 6, he says, Let no one deceive you with empty words. For because of these things, the wrath of God comes upon the sons of disobedience. Therefore, do not be partakers with them. He says, let no one deceive you with empty words. Those who practice um, Gnosticism, they believe that uh, material is evil. That anything that is of material is evil. God, do, God does not worry about them. They believe that Jesus Christ did not come in the flesh. That when he walked, he left no foot, footprints. So they believe that uh, the body is material, it is evil. And you can do whatever you want to do with your body. He says, as long as it's not your spirit, God is not mad at you. He doesn't worry about it. This is the belief they have. And with this kind of belief, so many have been deceived. In the world we live today, there are so many groups, so many people, even the government, who have changed the name of the names of uh, some of these uh, illicit sexual activities. They have coined a name to them. They have given them fancy, beautiful names just to make them acceptable to the society. To them, they say it's nothing wrong about it. It's just how you were born, you were created that way. They will even file lawsuits and say they were discriminated upon. But what does the Bible say? He says that evil is evil, regardless of what you call it. If the Bible condemns it, we condemn it. We can never be partakers of them. So don't let anybody deceive you with all these fancy names and, uh, and, and a, a different way of, of, of calling sin, sin. In Revelation chapter 20, John said that he saw the dead standing before God, small and great. He says, and the books were open. And another book was opened, which is the book of life. And he says, the dead, they were judged according to the things that, according to the things that were written in that book. And anyone whose name was not found written in the book of Lamb was cast into Gehenna, into lake of fire. There is going to be a day when we're going to stand in the presence of God. The white throne judgment. That day, people will be judged according to the things they did. According to their works. It's not going to be, it's not, it's not, it's not going to be what the government said. It's not going to be what the group of people here said. What this association said. What the group over there said. The name they coined. It's going to be according to the word of God. So don't be caught up on a wage with this kind of deception. What is evil is evil in the sight of God. Blessed be the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Glory, hallelujah, thank you, Jesus. Baruch Hashem, Adonai. We are now in verse 8. For you were once darkness... But now you are light in the Lord. Work as children of light. For the fruit of the Spirit is in all goodness, righteousness, and truth. 
finding out what is acceptable to the Lord. And have no fellowship with the unfruitful works of darkness, but rather expose them. For it is shameful even to speak of those things which are done by them in secret. But all things that are exposed are made manifest by the light. For whatever makes manifest is light. A while ago, he talked about work, walking in love. Now he's talking about walking in light. So the question is this. Where do we get light from? Because if you don't know where you get light, how are you going to walk in something that you don't have? That is the question. So where do we get light? Because many times people will say, walk in light, walk in the light, walk in the light. And someone is confused. He's asking, what is this light? Where do we get light from? What are they talking about here? <laughs> and many are confused. So first of all, let's find out where we get light from. The Bible tells us, he tells us where we get light from. David writing in Psalm 119 in verse 105, he says, Your word is a lamp unto my feet. It is a light unto my path. So we see the word of God is light. The, the word of God is light. The word of God is light. And in the same verse, in the same chapter, in verse 130, he says, the entrance of your word gives light. It gives understanding to the simple. Oh, the entrance of the word of God, he brings light with it. So now we know the source of light. The source of light is the word of God. Blessed be the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. So now we have the next question. How do we walk in light? Now we found out how to get light. And we know that we have the word of God with us. How do we walk in that light? And the Bible tells us again. James tells us not to be only hearers of the word of God, but doers. So when we hear the word of God, which is light, how do we walk in that light? By doing what the word of God says, by being a doer and not, a, and not just a hearer. Jesus tells us again, he says, let your light so shine among men that men seeing your good works will glorify your father which is in heaven. So he says, men seeing your good works. So by doing good works, men will see your light. This is how we walk in the light. Now, remember that uh, we don't fight people and we don't force them to walk in the light. The way that we can make people walk in the light is through our mannerisms. The way we speak, the way we conduct our activities. When we do this, we separate ourselves from them. The Bible says, what communion, what fellowship has light with darkness? There is none. There is no fellowship. When you come back to your house at night and you turn on the light, I've never seen before or had any story that light and darkness, they were fighting. And darkness is saying, I'm not going to leave. After you turn the light on, darkness is saying, I'm not going to leave. No! When light comes, darkness flees. <laughs> it dissipates the darkness. That is the way it is. So you shine brighter and brighter and brighter, even unto the perfect day, through being a doer of the word of God. That's what is calling us here. That's how we can be the light of the word. Do you know that Jesus Christ talked about domination, condemnation, and he associated it with light? He says, and this is the domination, that light came into the word, 
but men prefer darkness rather than light because their deeds were evil. They prefer to do the evil things because they don't want to be exposed. Why? Because light is that which makes manifest. That's what it's telling us here. But you are the light of the world. You are the one who's going to do what? Expose these, their behaviors. The behaviors which they do in the darkness. And it tells us when they come to you, telling you about those things which they have done in the darkness. Bible says it is even shameful to talk about those things which they did in the dark. It's telling us here. He says, when they come around and they tell you about those things which they've done in the darkness, you're going to tell them this way. I don't appreciate that kind of story. I don't appreciate that kind of behavior around me. And they will stop. Don't give them any chance. There is no fellowship between light and darkness. Oh, let your light shine so bright that they will have no other reason but be attracted to the light. Blessed be the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Baruch Hashem Adonai. Glory, hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. In verse 14, he says, Therefore, he says, Awake, you who sleep. Arise from the dead. And Christ will give you light. Oh, blessed be the name of the Lord. What is he talking about here? He's giving us our, the message to the unconverted. The message we give to those ones who are still in darkness. We speak to them and say, awake. Awake from your darkness. From your own belief. From your condemnation. Believe in Christ Jesus, for every work has been done. Receive the gift of righteousness, and Christ will give you light. This is our message to the world. Just like you tell someone your sins are forgiven. We don't have any right to forgive any sin. David says, only you have a sin and done that which is evil in your sight. Only to God that you sin. He is the only one who can forgive sin. But the Bible tells us, If thou shalt confess with your mouth, Lord Jesus Christ, and believe in your heart, God raised him from the dead, thou shalt be saved. And when any, whenever anyone is saved, their sins are forgiven. So all you are doing is confirming what the word of God already said by telling that one who received Jesus Christ, your sins are forgiven. That's what the Bible says. So this is our message. As we go out, as we meet people, our colleagues, co-workers, friends, relatives, he says, give them this message. Awake all you who sleep. Arise from the dead. And Christ will give you light. Christ is the light of the world. I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one will come to the Father unless they come through Jesus Christ. And this is the message we're going to tell them. It is only Christ who's going to give you that light. No other way that they can come in. Now we are in verse 15. We are making progress. We are halfway. See then that you work circumspectfully. Not as fools, but as wise, redeeming the time because the days are evil. Therefore, do not be unwise, but understand what the will of God is. Remember, we talked about walk in love. And then we talked about walk in light. Now we are talking about walk in wisdom. So the word here, circumspectfully, means careful. He says, walk carefully because the time is very short. Because the days are evil. He asks us to redeem the time. There is a reason why you are here in this world. There is a purpose why God created you here. If you don't know the reason why you are here, ask the Holy Spirit of God. 
Last week in Ephesians chapter 4, I believe it's verse 7, we covered about, it says, to every one of us is a grace given according to the measure of Christ's gift. To every one of us. There is no exception. He says grace was given according to the measure of the gifts of Christ. It's not only those who are in the fivefold ministry that are called. Christ has given gift to every one of us. But we got to find out what is this gift that God has given to us. What are we supposed to do for the kingdom of God? There is a purpose. Wherever you are, regardless of your occupation, whatever you do for the living, legitimate. You can be the light in that place. You can be the one that is advancing the kingdom of God in that place. Through your conduct, through your words, through financing kingdom projects, through other ministries. If you don't know, ask the Holy Spirit of God and he will show you. Remember, he tells us here not to be unwise, not knowing what the will of God is. And someone says, can you know the will of God? He's telling us right here, we can know the will of God. The will of God is in his word. It's written in the Bible. Now, where we cannot find the will of God written in the word of God, the Holy Spirit is in you to tell you. Because there are certain areas you don't have like it spelled out. But that's why we got the Holy Spirit in us. He's going to tell us if we ask him. So if you don't know what you're called to do, ask the Spirit of God. He will take you step by step. Remember, the, when it comes to the will of God, it is a progressive revelation. You're not going to get the whole picture at once. I know sometimes we want to get the whole picture. We want God to say it from A to Z and say, go and do it. But it doesn't work that way because he wants us to work by faith. So he gives us a step at a time. And throughout the scriptures, you can see this in the Old Testament, in the New Testament, it's always a step at a time. Abraham was called to go to a land that God is going to show him. So he left not knowing where he was going. He had no clue. But he has to obey the first step before God will give him the second one. Remember, Philip was told to go to Gaza along the desert. After Philip got to Gaza, that when he was told to join himself to the chariot, the Ethiopian eunuch chariot. Ch chariot. So he's always one step at a time. When Paul was making his way to Damascus to persecute the church, and after he encountered Jesus, he was told one thing to do, get into the city, and you will be instructed on the next step. So it's one step at a time. So you've got to be patient when you are finding out what the will of God is for your life. Because people are not patient, they have missed the will of God. So, Find out what you're supposed to do. Redeem the time, my friends. The days are evil. Tomorrow is not guaranteed to you. You don't know what tomorrow might bring. Are you hearing me, my friends? Today is the one that you have. So you got to make the best use of it. What are you doing for the kingdom of God? How are you preparing for eternity? Because there are people that are very conscious about the earthly things. They have made preparation for their retirement funds, their 401k, where they're going to live when they retire. All of these things, nothing wrong with them. But what about eternity? Have we made preparation for eternity? Jesus says, do not lay up treasure on the earth where mud and rust do corrupt. We are thieves break in and they will steal. He says, rather, lay up your treasures in heaven. We are neither much nor rush. Oh, destroys. No thieves break in and steal. For where your treasure is, there your heart will also be. So what preparation are you making? David says, teach us to number our days. 
that we may gain a heart of wisdom. That we will be very productive for the kingdom of God. In verse 18, he says, And do not be drunk with wine, in which is dissipation. But be filled with the Spirit, speaking to one another in psalms and in hymns and in spiritual songs, singing and making melody in your heart to the Lord. Blessed be the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Do not be drunk with wine. We are in in essence. But be you be filled with the Spirit of God. There are some Christians they are worried about Paul comparing wine with the Holy Ghost. But don't look at it that way. Look at the thing that is common between them. The one who has taken to the bottle is under an influence of alcohol. The one who is filled with the Holy Ghost is under the influence of the Holy Ghost. So the thing common here is under influence of something. So he's telling you here, instead of be under the influence of wine, be, let it be under the influence of the Holy Ghost. The one who got to the bottles, who's trying to use the bottles, alcohol, the wine, what is he looking for? He's looking for, he's looking to feel an emptiness. He's looking for joy, for satisfaction. But he doesn't find it. Rather, he finds emptiness. He finds drunkenness. He finds uh, 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 addiction. He finds all kinds of diseases. Sometimes he finds divorce. Sometimes he finds even up to death. He doesn't find it. So he tells you here, it's not a wise choice to go that route. But he wants you to be filled with the Holy Ghost. Now, he's talking about being filled with the Holy Spirit here. So I'm going to use this opportunity to tell you about threefold relationship we have with the Holy Ghost. Because this is one of the threefold relationship we have with the Holy Ghost. Relationship number one is Holy Spirit with us. Remember Jesus Christ talking to his disciples. He tells them about it. He's going to send them another comforter. He says, the world doesn't know about this comforter. He says, but he is with you and he's going to be in you. So the Holy Spirit with you, before you got born again, the Holy Spirit was with you. He was the one who convicted you of the one sin, the sin of rejection of Jesus Christ. He was there all along. So he convicted you and then you received Jesus Christ as your Lord and your Savior. And uh, when you got born again, he moved in. So now the Holy Spirit in you. Remember, by one spirit are we baptized into one body. The Holy Spirit is the one who baptizes people into the body of Christ. So he moves in, he is in you when you get born again. And he will never leave you nor forsake you. He's there. The Bible says, if any man has not the spirit of God, he is none of his. So he is there. Now, the next one is the Holy Spirit upon you. And that's the one he's talking about here now. The Holy Spirit upon you. Now, the Greek preposition is a P. Which means over. Upon, overflowing from within. There are so many Christians they have difficulty understanding about this experience. This is a subsequent experience after salvation. Some people call it infilling of the Holy Ghost, which is the, I think, is the right way to say it. And some people say baptism of the Holy Spirit. 
In this experience, Jesus Christ is the one who will baptize you with the Holy Ghost. John tells us that there's one coming after him who's going to baptize you with the Holy Spirit and power and fire. In this experience, the purpose of this experience is to be endued with power. To be a witness unto God. It's for you to be a vessel, empowerment that God can use to reach other people. That is the purpose of this experience. And I'm going to show you, giving you three different uh, instances in the Bible. That this experience is different from when you get born again. In, in, uh, in Acts of the Apostles, chapter 1, verse 8. Jesus Christ himself says, And you shall receive power after the Holy Spirit is come upon you. And you shall be witnesses unto me in Jerusalem, in all Judea, in Samaria, in even to the utmost part of the world. He tells us that it is a power and he gives us the purpose of the power for witnessing. You're going to receive the power after the Holy Ghost is come upon a P on you. And then he tells you when this power comes, it's going to help you witness. It's going to empower you to reach the unreached, to tell the untold, to win souls for Christ. Another place in the Bible is Remember when Paul was going to his third missionary journey? He's on his way to Ephesus. He came across some disciples and he asked them, Have you received the Holy Spirit since you believed? So he asked them, Since you believe. He's, talk, he's talking to believers, to Christians. And they told him, We never had it, there be any Holy Ghost. So he asked them, so in whom were you baptized? He says, John. And he, told, and he told them that the baptism of John was for repentance. Then he baptized them in the name of Jesus Christ and then laid hands on them and they spoke with tongues. So this experience often is evident by speaking with tongues. The day when the apostles were filled, when this experience that Jesus Christ promised them when he was fulfilled, they spoke with tongues. Paul laying hands on this, they also spoke with tongues. And if you study Acts of the Apostle very carefully, you will see that this experience is always associated with speaking with tongues. Now, the third example is when the church in Jerusalem had that the Samaritans have received the gospel because Philip went there and he preached Christ. They sent Peter and John and when Peter and John went there, they laid hands on them and they received the Holy Ghost. So this is a subsequent experience after you are born again for the reason of empowering you to do the work of the ministry. To be a vessel that God can use to reach the lost in the world. Blessed be the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. So we are making progress. Now the question is this. In this experience here, you can be filled over and over. Remember, you get born again once. Are you hearing me? <laughs> if any time they make an altar call and you show up to answer the altar call, I am asking you, why are you going there over and over again? You get born again only one time. <laughs> so, but this experience here, this influence of the Holy Ghost can be repeatedly done. And the Bible tells us, Remember in Acts of the Apostles chapter 2, on that day of Pentecost, when they were filled with the Holy Ghost, when the Holy Spirit gave them utterance, the same group of people who were filled with the Holy Ghost, if you go to Acts of the Apostles chapter 4, after the apostles were beaten and they were warned not to 
preach the name of preach in the name of Jesus Christ. Bible tells us that they went back to their own company and they prayed and they prayed and the place where they were was shaken and they were filled with the Holy Ghost. Again, the same group of people who were filled in Acts chapter 2, now they are filled again in, in Acts chapter 4. So the question is this, how do we get filled the first time? Because so many Christians, they don't know. So I'm going to Tell you how we get filled the first time. To be filled with the Spirit of God is an experience of faith. The same way that you were born again by faith in what Jesus Christ did, you are filled by faith. Remember, Jesus Christ said, If you, being evil, know how to give good things to your children how much more will the heavenly father give his holy spirit to those who ask him so you ask are you hearing me by faith and you will receive by faith it's very simple prayer they don't have to lay hands on you nothing wrong with lay hands on you but you can receive, you can be filled with the Holy Ghost without someone laying hands on you. You do not have to tarry. You do not have to wait. It belongs to you right now. When somebody is giving you a gift, do you have to wait to receive a gift? No, you receive and you say, thank you, I appreciate it. This is how you receive the Holy Ghost. Simple prayer. Father, I thank you. Because in your word, you say that if I ask you for your spirit, you will fill me with the Holy Ghost. Jesus Christ, I understand that you are the baptizer. For John says that you will baptize us with the Holy Spirit and fire. Holy Spirit, I trust you now that you will give me utterance in the spirit. Father God, with faith now, I receive and I believe that I'm now filled with the Holy Ghost. Blessed be the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Open your mouth. Whatever syllables that come out, speak it out. It gets better and better. Very simple prayer. That's how we get filled with the Holy Ghost. Now, the question is this. How do you get filled over and over? Because it is experience that we have to experience over and over every day. You get it by praying. Fellowship with God and the Holy Ghost. By speaking in tongues. You get filled and over and over again. And how do you know that you are filled? My friends, when the water reaches to the brim, it's going to flow out of the cup. Is it not true? When you are filled, you will begin to speak in psalms, in hymns, in spiritual songs, making melody in your heart to the Lord. Blessed be the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. So now, you know about this experience. Are you going to wait again? Don't wait. Remember, this is how you are empowered to do the work of the ministry. To be able to fulfill that which God has called you to do. So don't go and, and relax and maybe uh, uh, speak in tongues once in a month or once in two months. And then try to reason through it. No, the word of God tells you. I have a teaching that I call Speaking in tongues is for every believer. If you find that teaching, it's going to help you, give you more light. Because I spoke about speaking in tongues and being filled with the Holy Spirit in details in that teaching. So get hold of that teaching. It's available on YouTube, online, our website, and, and, and it will help you. Bless you in the name of Jesus Christ. So we are now in verse 20. Giving thanks always for all things to God, the Father, in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. This is one of my favorite verses in the Bible. Giving thanks for all things. The Bible tells us, now remember, we are not giving thanks for the bad thing that happened. Bible tells us in all things give thanks for this is the will of God concerning you in all things we are not thanking God because something bad happened that's not the reason why we're giving thanks but why are we giving thanks if we understand that God loves us unconditionally we will give thanks 
If we understand that God, even though he is behind the scene, he's moving everything that is behind the scene, we will give thanks. When we understand that all things work together for good to those who love God, we will give thanks. Are you hearing me, my friends? When we understand that uh, his ways are higher than our ways, his thoughts are higher than our thoughts, we are going to give thanks. If we understand that God is in control, that he sees the end from the beginning, we're always going to give thanks, regardless of the situation we find ourselves. Do not have a narrow anthropomorphic, anthropomorphic concept of God. Are you hearing me? When you do this, you limit God. Just like the Israelites did. They limited the God of Israel. The Holy One of Israel. And they suffered the consequences for 40 years. Understand that he is the one who said, Behold, I am the Lord, the God of all flesh. Is anything too hard for me? Understand that he says, I can do exceedingly, abundantly, above all you can ask or think. He is the God Almighty. He sees everything. Even in that your situation, when you think you are hemmed in, when you don't understand why would God allow this thing to happen to me, I am disadvantaged. Bible says, give thanks. Because if you understand that he is there, watching, making things to work out for your good and for his glory, you will smile and say, this is an opportunity for God to manifest himself. Think about it this way. If Jesus Christ only died for us, and gave us eternal life. It would have been enough. But he did not stop there. He gave us the Holy Spirit. Now the Spirit of God can dwell in these earthen vessels. If he stopped there. It would have been enough. But he did not stop there. His body was broken for us. So that we can receive healing. When we are attacked in our bodies. If he stopped there, it would have been enough. But he did not stop there. Now he says, come boldly unto the throne of grace that you may obtain mercy and find grace for help in the times of need. Now we can come boldly in the presence of God Almighty without any fear or guilt. If he had stopped there, it would have been enough. But he didn't stop there. Now we have the hope. Of the appearing, the glorious appearing of our Lord Jesus Christ. When these mortal bodies will put on immortality. If he had stopped there, it would have been enough. But he didn't stop there. Now we have the hope of spending eternity with the Father God and Jesus Christ. Blessed be the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Now all of these things are eternal things. They are big stuff. And you think that the one who has taken care of these eternal things for you, is not able to take care of earthly things, the little things that trouble us, the minor things that trouble us, looking for extra money to pay our bills, for a place to live, for a car to drive, for healing. Are you thinking that if God, Jesus took care of this eternal problem, He's going to not work out these ones for you. Don't be the driver on the back seat. From the back seat, he's controlling and telling the one on the steering wheel. You're going too fast. No, 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 no. It's, you missed that car. A little, you, you should have hit that car. You missed that car by a chance. No, 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 you should make a left on there. No, 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 too speed, too, too fast, too slow. He is you are driving from the back seat. Are you hearing me? Let Jesus Christ be on the steering wheel. He knows how to drive you safely to your location without you being crushed. 
He sees the end from the beginning. Now there are things that we ask God. Let's let's say for an example, three years ago, and they did not come to pass. And now you are thanking God that those things did not come to pass because they would have been to your own disadvantage. So that's why I say, if you believe that he is in control, that all things work out together for your good, you will give thanks in every situation. Blessed be the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Glory, hallelujah. Now in verse 21, it says, submitting to one another in the fear of God. He's talking about tolerance here. That you don't have that uh, ego. It must be me. I must give the instruction. I must give the order. I'm not going to listen to what the other one got to say. Their contributions don't matter to me. I'm in charge. He says, loosen up. Submit to one another. Listen to what they got to say. How can two agree except there be one? You cannot. Most of the time, there is no way you can be productive if you are the person who makes all the decision and will never listen to any contribution for another, from another. So he says, loosen up. Submit to one another. Have that uh, spirit of tolerance in you. Now we are in verse 22. It says, wives, submit to your own husbands as to the Lord. For the husband is head of the wife. As also Christ is head of the church. And he is the savior of the body. Therefore, just as the church is subject to Christ, so let the wives be to their own husbands in everything. God in his infinite wisdom gave only two rules in marriage. Because right here he's talking about marriage. And I know I'm going to step on people's feet, people's toe. <laughs> but bear with me <laughs> and listen because... This is the word of God. God in his infinite wisdom gave only two rules in marriage. He gave one to wives, one to husbands. For he understood that if he had come up with 20 rules for a happy marriage, you probably will remember them. You, you probably would not even understand all of them. But he gave only two rules. So now, we're going to talk about, I'm going to talk about wives first. He says, wives, submit to your own husbands. Now, submit here has nothing to do with gender inequality. It has nothing to do with being subservient. It has nothing to do with you being uh, inferior. Because the Bible tells us that in the sight of God, we are all equal. Paul, writing to the Galatians, says, For there is neither Jew nor Gentile, neither male or female, neither bond or free, for you are all one in Christ. In the sight of God, we are all equal. It does not mean that a woman cannot bring um, influencing ideas to the table. But what is, it, what is it saying here? God understands that a man has this um, masculine ego to lead, to be the boss. And he made it this way. 
so that things will work out right. The word here, the word here says head. Husband is the head of the wife. The word head there means authority or a leader. God, a man has a calling upon his life. So wives, he's telling you here, a man has a calling upon his life, which God called him. He did not call himself. God called him to be a leader, to lead in the house. Now, remember that he's talking about here in the house, not outside the house. You don't go out there and you expect other wives to submit to what you got to say. That's not what he's talking about here. This is between a husband and the wife in a, in a home. So, the wife, the Bible is telling you here, help the husband fulfill the call upon his life by submitting. This is what God called him to do. And he says, when you do it, do it not out of compulsion or force or fear, but willingly. He says, as unto God, you are not doing it for him. Are you understanding me? You are doing it as unto Christ. That's what he's telling us here. So, you do it regardless of what he is doing. Because whatever he does is between him and God. You do your own part, what you've been called to do. You help him because God has called him into this position to do the work which God has called him to do. When the problem comes is when he is deviating from that which is in conformity with the word of God. If your husband tells you, hey honey, we got to cheat in our taxes this year. We just have to change the numbers. So we can get more money back. You're going to politely and respectfully say, sweetheart, that will not be pleasing to God. Are you hearing me? So unless he deviates from the word of God, you are called to help him fulfill the call of God upon his life. Jesus Christ did this. The Bible tells us in Philippians, he, he says, Him being in the form of God, thought it not robbery to be equal with God. But he emptied himself of his reputation, became like one of us, obedient even unto death. So Jesus is a very good example equal with God. In the beginning was the word. The word was with God and the word was God. Jesus Christ from the beginning was God. But he thought it not robbery in being equal with God, but he emptied himself of his glory. And he became like one of us. So when you look at Jesus as your example, you will have to help your husband Answer the call which God has called him to do. Just like when we elect our president. It does not mean that the president is smarter than everybody in the country. You know, we can tell by the kind of decision they make sometimes. But according to the law, you got to respect his office. You may disagree with his personal policies, but you got to respect the Office of the presidency. That's what he's telling you here. Is a call upon his life. God has called him into that place. And he wants you to help him out. Fulfill the call of God upon his life. Blessed be the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. So now we're going to talk about men. 
as we proceed in verse 25. Husbands, love your wives just as Christ also loved the church and gave himself for her. That he might sanctify and cleanse her with the washing of water by the word. That he might present her to himself a glorious church. Not having spot or wrinkle or any such thing. But that she should be holy and without blemish. So husbands ought to love their own wives as their own bodies. He who loves his wife loves himself. For no one ever hated his own flesh, but nourishes and cherishes it. Just as the Lord does the church, for we are members of his body, of his flesh, and of his bones. For this reason, a man shall leave his father and mother and be joined to his wife, and the two shall become one flesh. This is the great mystery. But I speak concerning Christ and the church. Nevertheless, let each one of you in particular so love his own wife as himself, and let the wife see that she respects her husband. Blessed be the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. So now, God gave the husbands only one rule. Not 20 of them, only one. And that rule is, Love your wives just as Christ also loved the church. God understands that a woman needs to feel loved. She wants that assurance that she's loved. That you're not going to run off with another chick tomorrow. Or be keeping some on the side. She wants that assurance. So now, a man, the husband, should show her this assurance by words and also by actions. You don't only say, I love you, honey, I love you, honey, and then your character on the side says otherwise. Are you hearing me, man? Are you hearing me, husband? It compares the way that you should love your wife to the way Christ loved the church. How does Christ love the church? Is the question. His love to the church is sacrificial, unconditional, and everlasting love. As the head of the church, he leads the church. There is no debate about it. And we can see the way that Christ is leading the church. In his ministry, we can see it very clear. He was full of love. He gave his own life for us. He was patient. Knowing fully that uh, uh, Judas is going to betray him, but he still did not kick him out and say, hey, I know what you're thinking. Now you out of here. No, he didn't. He loved Judas even to the end. So you got to be patient with your wives. He was compassionate. Remember, he went about healing those who were oppressed of the devil. So many you are called to be compassionate with your wives. Remember and consider them as the weaker vessel, Peter tells us. Now, Jesus was not a weakly. Are you hearing me? He was not. For he cleansed the temple twice. One in the beginning of his ministry, and one once again at the end of his ministry. So, men, you are called to be leaders. You don't sleep on a job. You don't fold your hands and say, <laughs> they're going to figure that one out. <laughs> or not doing anything or not leading. Because that's when the wife will step up and try to take over the leadership because you're not doing anything. You're trying to sleep on a job. <laughs> so don't be a weak leader. It tells you to be active. 
Not the things that need to be done. The things that need to be done, you do them. Loving your wives like your own self, like your own body is for your own good. <laughs> Are you hearing me, friends? Because it's going to save you from so many trouble, so many problems. Now, anytime these two rules are kept, you will see a marriage like a voluminous breeze from the blazing sun. But anytime one of these rules is broken, or the two rules are broken, now a marriage can be like a hell on earth. Problems will begin to arise and they begin to compound. To the extent that people will begin to plan how to hurt one another in a deeper way. To the extent that people will begin to think about divorce. And the Bible tells you that God has divorce. But before I conclude, this is a very important Take home for both wives and husbands. Are you hearing me? Pay attention. Very important. If you catch this one, you will have a very happy marriage. Now, the key is this. Do not depend on your natural ability to be able to do this. It's impossible. Are you hearing me? If God will depend on the Holy Ghost, He is the only one who can empower you to do this. The problem so many marriages are having is because the man and the woman are depending on themselves to be able to live a happy marriage. And they are neglecting the Holy Ghost. The empowerment of the Holy Ghost to be able to do this. So you ask the Holy Spirit to help you. Give you wisdom, understanding, revelation. When to do something, when not to do something, how to do it. This is very important. And as long as you depend on the Holy Ghost, you will always have that successful marriage. Blessed be the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. My friends, I have come to the end of today's teaching. If you're hearing my voice and you are not yet born again, you are not a Christian, you can be a member of a church and even baptized in water, but you are not a Christian. Why? Because people don't understand what it means to be a Christian. Being a Christian means that you let go your self-righteousness, which means depending on your own works. And then you depend 100% on Jesus Christ. You believe that he is a son of God. He died for your sins. God raised him from the dead. And then you ask him to come into your life, be your Lord and your savior. And you begin a relationship with him. That's what it means to be born again. Unfortunately, not so many people understand this. That's why we have so many people in the church who are not born again. They are depending on their own personal works. You don't get into the kingdom of God through your own personal works because all our righteousnesses are as filthy rags in the presence of God. The Bible tells us in Isaiah. There is only one way that you can come in, be born again. That only one way is Jesus Christ of Nazareth. Jesus himself says that I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father but by me. No other name under heaven given among men whereby we must, we, we must be saved, if not the name of Jesus Christ. Except a man be born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. It's impossible. Unfortunately, there are so many people, so many religions, and they believe that uh, all roads lead to heaven. To, 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 to God. 
And the difference between Christianity and other religions, the difference is, in other religions, they are trying to contact God, to reach God through their own works. But in Christianity, man is receiving what God has given free, the gift of righteousness, without works. That's the difference. The day you hear his voice, harden not your heart. Today is a day of salvation. Now is the accepted time. Do not postpone it any longer. Don't say, let me go get my acts together and then I'll come and I'll be born again. Let me go get ready. You don't have that time, my friends. Tomorrow is not guaranteed to you. You don't know what tomorrow might bring. Just today alone, about 155,000 people died in the world. What kind of preparation did they make for eternity? If they did not receive Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior while they were still alive, they would go to hell. Hell is a real place. It's a place of torment, a place of torture. Where those who reject Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior will spend eternity. Hell, as a matter of fact, will be transferred into Gehenna, which is an outer darkness. Burning with fire and brimstone for eternity. Think about that kind of situation. That's why it is important that you make a choice. No one is going to make this choice for you. Your parents, they cannot. Your friends, they couldn't. You are the only one. The Bible tells us that, Behold, I stand at the door and I knock. Anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come in and I will eat with him. He will eat with me. So you will be the one to open the door for Christ to come into your heart. Are you planning to do that? There is no other way. Jesus Christ, when he was about to go to the cross, in the Garden of Gethsemane, he says, Father God, if, there is, if it is possible, take this cup from me. Nevertheless, not my own will, but your own will be done. God did not take that cup from him. He went to the cross. His prayer was not answered. That tells us there is no other way human being could have been saved if not Jesus going to the cross. So don't deceive yourself. He is the only way. You cannot go anywhere around him to come into the kingdom of God. He says, if you believe not that I am he, you will die in your sin. And he says, this is a domination. The light came into the world. But men preferred light, they prefer darkness instead of light. Because that this were evil. I'm going to lead you now in a very simple prayer. If you pray this prayer and you mean it with all your heart, you will right now be born again and become a child of God. Father, I come to you in the name of Jesus Christ. I believe he is your son. He died for my sins. That you raise him up from the dead. On the third day, dear Lord Jesus, I ask you this day to come into my life, be my Lord and my Savior. I believe now that I'm a child of God, I'm born again, my sins are washed away. Thank you, Father, in the name of Jesus. Congratulations, welcome into the kingdom of God if you prayed that prayer. Now, there is a subsequent experience. If you listen to my teaching today, we call that subsequent experience the infilling of the Holy Spirit, which means power to be able to be a minister, to be able to witness to others. If you want to know more about this experience, uh, there is a teaching on YouTube titled Speaking in Tongues is for Every Believer. It will help you and give you light and it give you understanding about this subsequent experience. Now you are a baby Christian. So it's very imperative that you find a good church where they teach the word of God. Become a member of that church. Buy a Bible and put your nose in the word of God. The only way you can grow in your faith is through the word of God. 
because faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. Don't let the enemy steal this thing, this experience that just happened right now. Don't let him steal it from you. Protect it to the word of God. I want to use this opportunity thanking all our partners all over the world. Those that are helping us through their prayers, through their services, through their financial support to reach other people with the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ. If you want to become a partner, please go to our website, kuim.org, and there will be a way there how you can participate, how you can donate, and help us even reach more people for Christ Jesus. It is only those who hear the word of God. We call them the doers of the word of God. They are the only ones who get benefit from the word of God. My friends, I pray for you today. May God bless you and be with you. May he lift up his countenance upon you and give you wisdom and give you strength and give you understanding and give you revelation knowledge and give you divine health, prosperity and sound mind. In the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Friends, remember, there is always an end. Don't give up. There is always an end. And your expectations will never be cut off. Blessed be the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Oh, Candela, Anna Brende. Kushekubala, Askete, Fruitskala, Maskela, Put. Mary Bos, Kumbaliete, Kala, Alamaskumba, Elecrete. Jeribra, Jeribra, Tanskandal, Alamaskundolo, 